In July of 1952, a swarm of UFOs were seen over Washington, D.C. They were captured on radar and seen by over a hundred eyewitnesses. The U.S. Air Force held a press conference. The sightings were real, but photographs and footage associated with the event? They were fake. Does that matter? Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor and thanks for tuning in. 1952 was an interesting year. The Korean War reached a crescendo. It's the year when the US detonated its first hydrogen bomb. The Summer Olympics were on in Helsinki, Finland, and athletes were Cold War proxies. Medal count USA 76, USSR 71. At the very same time, two waves of UFO sightings took place over Washington, D.C. The weekends of July 19th and 20th and 26th through the 27th, called the Washington Flap. This was five years after Roswell. The nation had moved on from World War II and was generally uninterested in reports of UFO sightings. 1952 changed all of that. It all began at 11.40 p.m. on Saturday night, July 19th. Edward Nugent, an air traffic controller at Washington National Airport, now Ronald Reagan, Washington National, spotted seven objects on his radar screen, 15 miles southwest of the city, where no known aircrafts were allowed to be. Nugent supervisor Harry Barnes watched the objects on Nugent radar and later wrote, We knew immediately that a very strange situation existed because their movements were completely radical compared to those of ordinary aircraft. End quote. The photos and videos you are seeing, and I am using to visualize the events of July 1952, are not real. We'll discuss what they are and why they were used to discount the events as a whole. Until then, they are a visual reference because this is what people saw and got picked up on radar. But let's focus on the evidence. At Washington National Airport, Supervisor Harry Barnes had two additional controllers with equipment expertise check Nugent radar to make sure it wasn't malfunctioning. They found nothing wrong. Supervisor Barnes then called the tower, where two more air traffic controllers, Howard Cochlin and Joe Zacco, said they also saw the unidentified objects on their radar in the tower and that they took off with incredible speed. At this point, other objects began appearing in all sectors of the radar scope, multiplying to 11, 12, and more. When they moved over the White House, and the U.S. Capitol building, without identifying themselves, Barnes realized it was time to call Andrews Air Force Base, located 10 miles away, where an airman confirmed he too saw the radar signature of multiple unidentified objects. He also confirmed the visibility of the objects, and one, he said, quote, was like an orange ball of fire trailing a tail. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before, end quote. Fighter jets were immediately scrambled out of Andrews. Meanwhile, back on the runway at Washington National, an airline captain, S.C. Pierman, was on the tarmac, sitting in the cockpit of a McDonnell Douglas DC-4, waiting for a now-delayed authorization to take off. He saw six objects moving about the sky, and he observed them for a whole 14 minutes, appearing and disappearing while maintaining radio contact with Supervisor Barnes the whole time. A military officer is on record seeing the lights as well. Colonel Ross Dedrickson, he saw nine UFOs flying in formation over Washington DC, and he saw them close enough to make out their physical shape. They weren't just lights in the sky. He saw they were disc shaped and identical to one another. They were illuminated from within, he said, quote, they were quite visible and their formation looked suspicious to me, end quote. Military jets were in the air by now, and while they saw the lights in the sky, they couldn't chase them because they appeared and disappeared and then reappeared in a different location at will. The sightings caught the attention of the media because too many people were seeing too many craft, so much so 
that President Harry Truman was forced to hold a press conference and make a statement saying, quote, We discussed the topic of UFOs in every meeting the administration has with the military. There are always things like that going on, said President Truman, casually. U.S. Air Force Intelligence Captain Edward Ruppelt led Project Grudge up until 1952 and then Project Blue Book until 1953. This means his full-time job was to study UFOs in 1952. He's the guy credited for coining the term unidentified flying object or UFO. He stated something very curious worth repeating in its original form, said Captain Ruppelt. A few days prior to the Washington incident, a scientist from an agency that I can't name and I were talking about the buildup of reports along the eastern seaboard of the United States. At the end of the two-hour conversation, the scientist made a prediction. From his study of the UFO reports he was getting from Air Force headquarters and from discussions with colleagues, he said that he thought that we were sitting right on top of a big keg loaded with saucers. Within the next few days, he told me, and I remember that he punctuated his slow, deliberate remarks by hitting the desk with his fist. They're going to blow up and you're going to have the granddaddy of all UFO sightings. The sightings will occur in Washington or New York, he predicted. Probably Washington, said Edward Rubbled. Seen here in a photo with Captain Edward Rubbled of Project Blue Book is Air Force General John Samford, who held a conference on the sightings in Washington, D.C. on July 29, 1952. The conference was designed to calm the public and deflect the interest of the media. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation, since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberrations. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. We have, as a date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage. And that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. He rationally dismissed the majority of UFO sightings, and it's nothing to get frustrated over. Let's focus on what he also said. Since 1947, a certain percentage of the sightings are made by credible observers making relatively incredible claims. It's the 5% rule that Project Blue Book later confirmed as unidentified and what Nick Pope confirms as the ratio of unexplained aerial phenomena in the UK inventory of reports since World War II. A few months later, in January 1953, the CIA commissioned the Robertson panel, tasked with recommending a method in dealing with UFOs. The result was a twofold recommendation. One, to deny the reality of UFO sightings and explain them away as natural or man-made phenomena while simultaneously investigating them in secret. The denying became a program of debunking eyewitnesses, ridiculing whistleblowers, and threatening anyone within the military, its industrial complex, and at government agencies, soon to include NASA, 
to stay silent by order of national security and top secret classification of any and all such information or else face consequences. It is interesting to note that the men in black phenomena rose from this era. They wore 1950s clothes and drove 1950s cars, almost cartoonish if it weren't for the threats and intimidation, a topic for another episode. And let's not forget Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time. Churchill became very curious about the reported sightings in Washington, and on July 28th, the eve of the press conference in Washington, Churchill sent a memo to Lord Cherwell, Britain's Secretary of State for Air Defenses, asking, What does all this stuff about flying saucers mount to? What can it mean? What is the truth? Let me have a report at your convenience. End quote. The response he got from Cherwell was that a previous study had already been made that concluded the flying saucers were most likely easily explainable as birds, weather balloons, optical illusions, weather inversions, conventional aircraft, and hoaxes. UK Air Marshal Hugh Dowding had a different take. He said, I am convinced that these objects do exist and that they are not manufactured by any nation on Earth. I can therefore see no alternative to accepting the theory that they come from some extraterrestrial source. End quote. I stated early on that the UFO video footage over the state capitol building and most of the photographs are not real. The photograph of 11 objects flying by the capitol rotunda is claimed to have been shot the night of July 12, 1952 but the photographer has never been named or found. The photographs only began appearing in 1965 in newspaper articles. Thirteen years earlier, in 1952, newspapers and magazines would have paid good money for a right to publish. The 1965 photo, however, was cleaned up, colored, and since then kept reappearing in different versions to become synonymous with the events themselves. In 1976, Several photo analysts, including Dr. Bruce Maccabee, concluded the UFOs were a reflection of the streetlights in front of the Capitol building, seen through a glass window where the photograph was taken. Regardless, eyewitnesses from 1952 who have looked at these photos recognize them to be a fair depiction of what they saw. Therefore, we cannot state with certainty if they're real or fake. The video footage I've shown you was first created for a documentary in 2005 called UFO The Secret Evidence. The CGI artist credited used the photographs as a basis to create the footage, lights flying behind the rotunda and all. Does this matter? Let's tally the evidence. Six air traffic controllers at Washington National Airport saw the UFOs on three different radar screens. Imprints were created. One traffic controller at Andrews Air Force Base saw them on a radar screen and also with his naked eye. An airline pilot taxiing at Washington National saw it with his naked eyes as well, and a decorated U.S. Air Force colonel did report his sighting as well. At least one of the pilots who were sent to scramble the lights reported them with his bare eyes. Over a hundred eyewitnesses, additionally, also saw them. The governmental responses from Truman and Churchill down through the brass prompted statements, memos, and press conferences, the largest press conference, by the way, held since the end of the war. All of that hoopla was not because of nothing. Occam's razor, folks. It's time to put it to bed. The Washington flap was real. What gets me is the timing. We were settling into a comfort zone at home following a world war and chasing an American dream. We were making incredible technological breakthroughs, detonating nuclear bombs. The Korean War raged and Cold War tensions were escalating rapidly. The presence and existence of UFOs was ridiculed wherever it surfaced. Perhaps the Ebens thought, all things considered, it's time to let these earthlings know we exist without question. And we, the earthlings, have had nothing but questions ever since. 
You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness. And please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for listening. See you next time.